Hello and uh, welcome to the first day of uh, developer sessions at EDX 2019. Uh, coming up later today, we've got sessions on Beyond a Steel Sky and Dying Light 2. Uh, but next up, uh, we have a panel on discussing uh, exploring entertainment in augmented reality. And please welcome your, your panel host, Daniel from AIXR. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us today. And I'm uh, privileged uh, to be joined by some fantastic individuals here, uh, including Joseph from Vision, uh, Jason from Harmony Studios, and Rob from Playlines. So um, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and we'll just dive into a few things, because I think the augmented reality space when it comes to gaming and entertainment is a really interesting one, which is still developing. So um, I thought it'd be good to touch on a few Real key trends, really. Um, so, Rob, um, with uh, kind of you know the stuff that you've been doing at Playlines, what what kind of key trends have you seen recently? Blimey. Okay. Um, so, Playlines specialises in location-based uh, augmented reality. We create layers of content that's tagged to the real world, um, and I think that's something that we've been pushing for a few years talking about the idea of seamlessly being able to navigate a digital layer of content whether that's a story or an adventure or something gameplay driven um, for while actually walking around the real world that's one of the things that's always been most exciting about AR for me and I've been having that conversation for four years and trying to talk through what it might mean that conversation became a lot easier a couple of years ago when Pokemon Go came out because that gave people a sense of what creating gameplay and creating kind of an identity for the player that could change the way that you walk to the shops. That's something that obviously we're now seeing um, Niantic start to capitalize on. And we've seen other people start to make geolocated games like that as well they're quite hard to achieve, which is why we're not seeing too many other kind of clones of the same kind of experience. Now that um, uh, Wizards, oh god, it's dropped out of my head. Um, the, what's it called? Wizards, yeah. Um, now that it's out, I think we're starting to see that in keeping with a lot of the other technology that we all have in our pocket now, people are much more familiar with the idea of walking down the street and being given contextual information about even something as simple about as to where to turn in order to get to where you're going via Google Maps. So I think the trend of increasingly people being used to having contextual digital content that's useful appearing in their pocket, vibrating, or even talking to you through some headphones, and starting to see that in kind of heads-up displays of the kind of Google Glass that we've seen. I think those things, even though things like Google Glass have stuttered a lot, we're starting to see that people are more familiar with it, which means for augmented reality developers like us, we can start to create gameplay, story, adventures that take place in the real world, and people are used to the idea of dialing into a, a digital experience while they're walking around on, on normal streets. Uh -huh. Whether that involves a graphical component or whether it's just contextual digital information. I think so that, that's the trend I'm most excited about. Yeah, and I think that's you know, a, a lot of really good points there. And I think, uh, uh, Kind of, Jason, you've had the privilege of working with some fantastic brands over the years. I mean, what have you seen when we're coming into kind of more the entertainment market now of AR? Yeah, so um, we're, we're an augmented reality studio, so we, we specialize in developing for both brands on one side to do experience that, that is um, uh, sort of encapsulating engagement, entertainment, and gamification. And then on the other side, we have our own toy um, brands, which have... Uh, you know, product lines where we can use augmented reality and, and create this new layer, this new enhancement to sometimes quite traditional uh, toys and games. Um, it's still a very awkward technology. It's difficult to explain to people. Um, it's, you're asking a lot of the user to, to download apps and understand what's happening and how to utilize it. And I think certainly one of the, the trends that we are seeing and we're right at the beginning of is how that technology becomes easier and, and becomes more integrated into a, 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 an easy flow into the entertainment and end goal of, of having the, using the technology in the first place. And uh, no, great points there, I think. And Joseph, why, why now? Why are we seeing these changes in AR kind of content coming out now? 
<laughs> Not um, an easy question. Well, yes. I, so I think there are, well, over the last few years, there have been you know, many driving forces um, from a software, hardware, uh, content creation, accessibility, um, government funding. Um, so everything started to converge and we're starting to reach this very sweet point where you know, there, there is sort of enough interest from, from the consumer markets. Um, the enterprise, let's just keep us aside for now because I don't think we can really, um, even though they have held drive the growth of, of, te of emerging technologies, I think now is when the consumer market is starting to pick up on it. Um, so just more accessible and the quality um, uh, versus cost experience is, you know, it's just there. Um, and I think also sort of 5G, um, that is also a very sort of strong, let's call it rocket fuel, that will enable a lot of these experiences to, to work fluidly and uh, to give that sort of experience that uh, a demanding gamer audience will, will want and expect from. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> Jason, we were speaking earlier just before this, um, where you made a controversial statement that you believe that Pokemon Go really isn't AR. What, what are your thoughts behind that? Yeah. Um, because on a technical level, it, it's not just by having a camera view in frame and, and overlaying. The, the most important part of augmented reality is the second part, it's reality. It's, it's understanding and believing what's happening. And, and Pokemon Go was great in terms of flag waving and popularity, and it, it got people understanding where the technology might go, but, uh, but it wasn't there to be totally believable. And I think when we start to get the reality integrated, and there's some really exciting things that are happening at the moment from the big kind of major tech companies who are playing with it to increase the, the link to the real world environment around a user, that's when it starts getting really exciting. So yeah, I was being pedantic. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, I, I want to dive in there because I also... So, Pokemon Go, I think it's a really useful example of where... When you, how many people have played Pokemon Go? Let's just get it in context. Okay, yeah. Lots. How many... Okay, so there's a switch in Pokemon Go that is the AR switch, and you can turn it on or off, and most people eventually turn it off to save the battery. What it does is turn off the superimposition that when you turn on your camera and you look at the street and you can see a discarded yogurt pot on the street and that's really there and next to it is a digital Pikachu that isn't there. But for me, I think that when you turn that switch off, the game is still AR because I think the most fundamental reality that it is augmenting is the map. Because the map is an expression of reality. It's, it, we're familiar with it because we can see where the street ahead of us is going, and that's, that corresponds to our reality. And it's augmenting that by just sprinkling enough interesting digital elements over that space to change the way that we navigate that environment. So for me, from, a, from kind of an artistic perspective, it's less about trying to achieve a reality in the sense of, because I don't think immersion is a trick. It's not something that you trick the player into, it's something that you know, I, I'm a student of literature originally, and suspension of disbelief, willing suspension of disbelief is still how you get players engaged in a fiction, whatever it is. So I think players who want to be and kind of come with you and come into your simulation, they're still getting their reality augmented because it's changing the way they interact with their reality, even though it's not trying to achieve something that is going to fool anybody per se. But this is an interesting point, is that what actually is an augmented reality experience when we're talking about immersive kind of entertainment? Um, because I've seen projects where you have basketball courts overlaid with kind of, uh, kind of advanced visuals and graphics. You know, is that augmented reality? I mean, I mean Joseph, what's your opinion of, of what defines an augmented reality experience? I'd say it's exp it has to be an experience where, you know, you, where there's a presence, where you feel that what you're, what you're interacting with actually is sitting there persisting in space within your physical setting. And if that's the illusion is real enough and that you buy it, I think that's augmented reality. Yeah, I mean, it, it, again, I mean, we'll probably continue to disagree, but that's probably a healthy part of the debate. Um, it, it's a visualization technology. I mean, AR stems from the ability of a device to understand something about the, the user's location, 
on, on a geo basis or on a, a spatial basis and present 3D and augmented content in and around the user that, that retains the context, it has meaning. So if we see something coming from behind a door or that we, we at least understand the surface around us or a, an object that it relates to, then we, we are able to give the user an, an enhancement to their vision that they didn't have before. But that's an interesting point on that as well because when we look at this, there's you know, huge differences but also similarities between uh, kind of AR content versus traditional 2D media. I mean, we're here at EGX where there's tons of different games at the moment with tons of screens and computers and um, uh, consoles. But how is developing for AR different to traditional methods? That, and, and bearing in mind that we're talking about gaming here, which isn't, you know, is, is not relatively an old technology still as well, yet we're still now going into AR in this industry. I don't know if, if Rob, you want to pick it up. So, um, so I want to, uh, for that one, I want to speak again from like an artistic design perspective. For me, I think, and again, like if, if, you're, if you're planning to develop for AR or if you're making something for AR right now, one of the really key things that I would say is different and that you have to consider is different from a conventional game is that the, the, one, of the, one of the most important realities that you have to augment is, is the player themselves. In AR, the player and the protagonist is usually the same person because what you're doing, what you're creating, is supposedly happening in reality, which means that the player is themselves when they experience it. Even if you're kind of putting a layer over the player to tell them that they're a wizard, the way that they're interacting with your experience is also the way that they interact with the real world. That's the goal. So even more so than you see in games with a silent protagonist, even more so than you see in games where you're kind of an enigma and you're de it's designed for you to be able to imprint your personality onto the game. When you talk to the player in AR, you have to talk to them as someone who is standing in the real world, surrounded by a world that they understand, whose, world, whose rules they understand because they've lived in the real world all their life. And you can't try to compete with their imagination or overwrite their imagination or their identity. You have to give them a little bit more because augmentation means adding something not taking something away. Joseph, I'm going to set you up here with a question. What are the rules for creating AR content? Oh, that's huge. Um, so ultimately, our goal is believability. And you know, we, we want to make sure that people uh, understand and engage and, and believe. The best reaction we can possibly have with anything we do in the studio is that whatever device somebody has in front of them, they have to look behind to double check. That, that feeling allows us to believe that we're getting towards a place where we've convinced them that there's part of this is, is genuinely real. Um, but it's more challenging because we have to think about where this app might be used. It's di if we do something in the studio in a lab base, we can achieve a lot more very easily, but we have to think about how this is going to go out into the wild. You know, we, we have the environment set up how we want it. The users can have any, any type of diverse environment from lighting, location, um, the content they, they might have in front, and we have to try and think through how it's still going to maintain a level of believability in, that, in, in use. I mean, Joseph, is there one correct way to make an AR experience? No, no, I don't think there is one because sort of it depends on many factors. It depends on you know, well, what is that real world and who is who is the you know the, who's the user, what device are they using, um, what is the experience. So being able to design that narrative, you know, sort of there's no one one size fits all. Um, so you have to really be very careful um, when you create the that narrative in terms of what are all the touch points. Um, how are they going to interact with it? Um, so there's a lot of thinking that has to happen. I guess because there's no real defined rules just now on, on that, because uh, we're kind of writing the rule book right, right now when it comes to AR content. Um, and that, that probably segues nicely into another question um, for yourself, Rob, because I think a lot of people within this room um, don't really understand what goes into an AR experience in particular because it is very different. You know, what other things, aside from the graphics, because we, you know, we've, we've talked quite heavily about that, really play into AR? So the type of AR experiences that my company makes um, 
actually don't use graphics at all. We don't superimpose graphics onto reality. We don't use a camera pass through or a headset. The kind that I make is an, a layer of contextually triggered audio, which you experience through headphones or because we're partnered with Bose, the headphone company, sometimes through one of their wearables. Um, so we have a layer of content which you trigger by walking around a real space, and which, because it's audio, triggers experienced seamlessly as kind of a heads-up experience, but without any graphics. What we have instead are live actors in the experience who are helping to build the world around you or to guide you through the experience. So we were talking about definitions earlier on. I don't tend to lose a lot of sleep about whether this is AR or XR or um, whichever buzzword you want, and indeed, because it's audio-led, there are some people who come and tell me that it's not augmented reality at all. Feel free to come and tell me that afterwards. We'll go and get a pint, because I love having that argument. Um, but I think, I think that, that means that there are some fundamental things that are still similar about the AR that we make and that other people are making, one of which is that the player is absolutely at the center of it. They're completely in control. You can't create a glass tunnel like you can create in video game design to keep the player where you want them to, because their reality is theirs. They understand how it works, and they can go wandering off in whichever direction they want. So I think the fundamental rule is that you can't also break rules of reality, because that pops people out of whatever kind of immersion you're trying to create. You can't create a door that you can't actually go through. You can't create a glass wall, which is something we're very used to experiencing in conventional video game level design. You can't bump up against something, because the player understands how reality works, and they won't buy it. Uh, especially if it's something that's trying to limit them, because everyone's reality is pretty constrained already, many people's more than others. And I think you know, you need to give them a sense that the rules are still the same, even if the physics aren't the same, or even if magic exists. So I guess what you're trying to say there is there's a, a lot more going on to a, a, an immersive kind of augmented reality experience than, uh, than is on the surface. Definitely, but again, I'd, I'd want to hear from the other guys because they make probably things that are closer to what we think of as conventional AR, so if there's a, even such a thing. <laughs> Um, yeah, I know. Like one of the biggest things that's that we're waiting for, and we've talked about before about where AR is on the graph and, and, how, and where does the future go. But it's this convergence, and it's this this understanding that the hardware at the moment is still clunky. When it's not a smooth process, but next year, if rumours are to believe, be believed, then Apple will be the last big tech company to step into the market. Um, they purchased a partner, of, a German partner of ours called Matteo about four years ago, and we saw some of the stuff that they were working on kind of in their R&D labs at the time, and it was really exciting, and I, and I hope that, that much of that gets delivered through. Certainly all the indicators are at the moment that that's where it's going, and studios like ourselves are, are really waiting for those barriers to drop and the ease of access to, to use in the market increases. So next year should be really exciting for it. So it seems that we're waiting for the hardware really to catch up to really make these experiences more powerful. Yeah, that, that, it, this, it's completely where the, the block is at the moment because um, it's, it's great to download it on apps and devices. We all have them. We walk around. They're very powerful. Um, but it's still a, a procedural problem to explain to somebody what you do, how you do it, um, and, all, and, and then when you interact, how you must interact. That as those barriers drop and the, the access to wearable or, or sleeker technology to, to do that for us um, happens, then we're in a, in a great position to see augmented reality sort of mm -hmm. really start to pick up. So Joseph, while we're on the topic of, of hardware, I mean, I know you, you briefly touched on 5G earlier. I mean, how do you see really like 5G changing this for, for the better? Um, well, we think it's going to be really critical um, for the sort of in the gaming space. Um, you know, we're talking with a few telcos, and even themselves, they they want to start building their own gaming properties because you know they obviously they'll have to sell 5G and sort of create a demand for it. So they do see gaming as um, as an area that will sort of potentially create that demand. Um, it is true that if you take any game and you sort of you could put it on, on 5G or on a cloud um, sort of network, do all the rendering on the clouds, but that might not make any big difference to the game. 
So it really goes back to the game. You have to sort of rewire the game, or you have to adapt it to 5G. You have to say, well, what is it that 5G does? Um, so, well, what know, is it that 5G does? <laughs> what does it do? Yes. Um, so essentially, it's the low latency. So really, what 5G does is allows you to, to play faster. Um, so from a game perspective, you know, unless there's a need to to have quick commands where you're working you know, with another player. It has to be a multiplayer experience. If you just take a standalone you know, shooter game, 5G isn't going to do anything. So the low latency basically is, is sort of, it really comes down to communication. It's how one device communicates to another device and to the cloud. So you have to start thinking about your games from that, through that prism. So how are we going to use the benefits of 5G, that low latency, that's sort of hyper, sort of fast um, sort of communication from one device to the next device to change the whole narrative of the game. So I think that is where you know, 5G can, can make a difference. So from, if there are any you know, gamers out there, you have to start thinking, OK, well, you know, how can you reap? Or how can you sort of leverage that sort of velocity uh, and the proximity of the cloud to, to change the, the game? And, and I guess to summarize that, I mean, 5G right now sounds a bit like a buzzword, right? a lot of, you know, a marketing term, but the, the improvements are significant and specifically in the latency side of things for kind of, you know, computing that's not on the device itself. Yes, no, there's, there's, there's a lot of noise about it. So, but we, we've got it pretty clear that uh, you have to change the experience to make 5G work from, from a game perspective. Um, we know that you know, these events are very important for 5G because you know, it allows them a place to interact with, you know, with the demanding audience that are going to say, listen, we need the 5G to be able to elevate or to enhance the game. Um, so I think that's why you know, the 5G providers will need to sort of be talking with, with this type of audience to say, OK, you know, what can you do with this? You know, how can we improve your game? You know, how can we start creating multiplayer game experience and augmented reality where you know you might be over there the other player might be on the other side of the hall and you know between the two of you you need some type of you know um, shared uh, team collaboration to defeat the other team um, yeah. yeah and Jason well we're, we've kind of gone into a, like a technical land and it makes you know sound quite far off in some ways but um, how, how do you go about developing for AR? What kind of tools are there out there for someone in this audience to say that might want to get involved? Yeah, so I, I, a lot of people will know Unity, for example. So you have a, a games engine that's able to handle the, the 3D, the rendering, but you also have a sort of open bed of, of um, scripting and languages available to, to make that happen. Um, so Unity up to kind of six months ago would dominate what we did for the past six or seven years in augmented reality. The interesting part about where we are now is that the big tech companies being involved uh, are bringing their own versions, their own flavors of how to implement. So you have Snapchat with Lens, you have Facebook, Instagram with Spark, um, you have web technologies so that now we don't even need an app, we can deliver straight to the browser. In fact, because QR codes are read, um, via most phones, particularly the Apple phones, then you can just QR code something, follow the link, and people don't see it as as big a hurdle or a technology that they have to understand. It just happens. And that diversity gives more choice for the user, but for a, for a studio like us, it means that we have to spread our knowledge and investment in how to deliver these things you know, to a wider, a wider set of options. And, and Rob, you were mentioning to me earlier about Bose's kind of new tool as well, which enables to change spatial audio. Right. So the, there's two components to that. So we're, we're partnered with Bose. They help us out with uh, our, our projects and we, we feed back. They have a tool coming out fairly soon, which will allow uh, creators to drop content onto a map. Uh, geolocate it, create a geofence, which means that that content is triggered when you enter that zone or create, reach within a certain proximity of something. And it's a nice, seamless tool that they're still working on and that they're still adding functionality to, which we had to develop our own tools to achieve what we artistically wanted to achieve in AR over the last few years. And now tools like this one, the creator tool from Bose, are coming out that are going to make that a much more streamlined process. It's going to make that a web-based 
based process so that again you just you you turn it on and it just starts working um, and that will I think it's going to open up a lot of possibilities if people here are considering working in AR then I'd strongly urge you to consider thinking about or designing or prototyping something that's geolocated something that you experience by walking around in the real world because I think it teaches you a lot about designing an experience that augments the player's experience that complements their own uh, imagination and that gives them something to do as they're experiencing the real world as it really is. So yeah, it's, it's a really valuable tool, even if it's going to replace the technology that we spent so long yeah. developing in our bedrooms. Perfect. Well, I'm, I'm conscious that I also want to open up uh, questions to the audience here. So just before, real quickly before I do that, rapid fire, what are, you know, if we were to do this talk again in 10 years, just bullet point, what do you think we'd be talking about? And we'll go kind of right to left. So I think that the proliferation of being able to add digital to the real world means that we're going to need to consider things like having a browser for reality as you walk down the street. There's going to be so much content tagged to your environment that you're going to need to choose which layer you're going to dial into, which person's perspective you see of the world. But that also introduces worrying things because as we know from the internet, it's all too easy to be able to create a bubble in which you don't really experience things that you don't want to or don't agree agree with or that counters your view of reality. Mm -hmm. What we fundamentally talk about in AR is the ability to customize our own level of reality. And that introduces some dangers as well as some coolnesses. And I think we're going to be talking about that in 10 years time. Jason, rapid fire. Uh, yeah, probably why we're still calling it augmented when it's one of the worst <laughs> words ever. And I've built a company on a, a, a phrase I can't stand. Um, but, but also, yeah, I, I agree that, that we'll probably be talking about the popularity of a fantastic tool that blocks out all advertising and, and kind of communications and corporate um, brand rubbish that for, as, we, as we take our walk in the, in the real world. And it will for be a price. A heaven for us all. And Joseph, bullet points. Yeah, I'd say that gaming will be um, sort of set free. It will be liberated, it will be played out in the wide world. We'll have like a 3D blueprint of the worlds. So everything will be overlaid and um, I don't know what it'll look like. But, you know, essentially be able to play anywhere, everywhere, on the go and uh, with as many people as you want. Perfect. Well, I'm going to open up the, the floor now to some questions. Don't be shy. It looks a little bit scary now with that light just on that microphone. But uh, if you have any questions for our panelists here to, you know, go over. Yeah, no, yourself, everyone yeah. agrees with us. Hi, guys. Thanks for the talk. Um, so you said that hardware is the main bottleneck for progress in augmented reality. Um, what do you, what kind of hardware medium do you see augmented reality going to in the future? I mean, obviously, screens and cameras on our phones isn't going to be it. Is it going to be Google Glass, um, eye contact lenses, a VR helmet that's see-through, or even Neuralink? Like, where do you see it going? That's uh, future gazing. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, with the hint of that, you know, Apple is probably going to release something that will, you know, um, be very accessible, will probably be, you know, sort of decent in quality. So it will be up here on the eyes, but it'll be some type of glass optics, um, hands-free, because you want to have your hands free to play. Yeah. The holding of tablets, as you know, it just yeah. doesn't cut it. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember starting the company in 1996, and I was trying to explain to somebody that in the future we'll be carrying computers around with us or, or everywhere we go. And of course, conceptually, that was thinking, well, how do you carry a cream box and a screen and cables? And so trying to understand what we, are, we see as augmented reality now as the HoloLens or Google Glass is, is nothing like where we'll go with it. Apple is a really good... Um, it, it's a really good case in point in that Apple are not primarily innovators, they're popularizers, and they are the best popularizers in the world. Like every financial will tell you about that. So um, it, it, they will be the pivot point when they provide us with a product that we can engage with and then believe that we couldn't live without, and that is probably wearables in the first point. But I love the Neuralink. <laughs> I can see it going there, yeah. definitely. Yeah, I think uh, if I was that, like... I think people will play around with all of those technologies. Um, and I think with, with mixed results. I mean, for me, what I hope is that 
it's people will continue playing around with ways of, of augmenting the world that aren't just vision based but if if you want a, a, a complete vision of what that kind of a world might look like and what its technology looks like, there's a novel that's 20 years old now called Rainbow's End by Werner Winger, which contains an entire very plausible example of what this kind of world would look like. And that's based on uh, digital contact lenses and a small wearable. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you very Great. much, guys. Thanks. Next question, please. Hey, well, uh, right. Uh, I suppose question really similar note. Um, Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I suppose as well, like the infrastructure underlying that um, uh, augmented reality, not just the hardware side, but more the software side. Um, like we've got a few companies already, like Open Map or even um, Google Maps, or I think Microsoft are working their own Azure stuff. Uh, where do you guys see things like being able to um, put things in? reality from digital side of things as well, like maps and whatnot. Yeah, um, it, it, it's a very good point. And I mentioned before about the tech companies. Uh, up to now, a, a few years ago, they were all aware of augmented reality. And they were kind of just swimming gently in and around it, but none of them were taking it seriously. Now you have all of them with offerings to the market. So they're starting to see if they can get an inroad now and build up the presence, they'll become dominant. But they all have a different way of achieving that. They all have their own proprietary methods. And I don't know who's going to be the winner. I don't know if it's going to be Facebook or Snapchat or Amazon or Google or Microsoft or Apple, but they're all in there. Um, and you know, we, we just have to ride the waves. And you as consumers ultimately make the decision. So that's probably the, the dictate as to what, what will be the long term. I think one of the other interesting things to think about in that context as well is what the software can take from the real world. So one of the reasons Unity is so successful is because of the store, because it allows you to buy a gun and uh, you know, a model of a cool plasma gun and put it in the game that you're making and not have to model it yourself. At the point, now we know that Facebook's approach to this is that they are planning to make a clone of the world, like a digital entire clone of the entire world in order to have a sense of the entire world to augment. But that raises the question of, if I see a lamppost that I kind of like, am I going to be able to clone that lamppost and then blah, 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 put as many of them as I like in? Because the real world is sufficiently digitized that I can then take that as an asset and use it somewhere else. Not really an answer to your question, but I think it's an interesting thing to think about. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is more of a follow-up question for uh, the first thing that was asked regarding the hardware, but the, I'll arrange that. What I'm talking about is that you talked about a lot of the standardization of uh, AR technology. So we can use it in more devices or in uh, take different approaches to the same, uh, the same space in, in a way. But what I'm more interested in here, in your opinion on, is what if you're using more niche technology, more, uh, more, more unique peripherals that also impact not just the hardware, but maybe also the software and how you approach AR? Yeah, uh, th there's different case uses. So sometimes um, if we're developing experiences for brands, they will want to do something for events or for exhibitions or things where they can play with the environment, but it's customized and focused very much on that one thing. So we can create hardware. We, we can design our own tools and set up, and that allows us technical freedom, but it's very restricted user delivery. When we want to look at very wide user delivery, we have to go to those, what, the wider set of tools that, that allow an end user to interact and be part of the story. Um, so it, for us, it depends on a project by project basis as to what technical scope we have available, as to which of those very niche or mass technologies we can employ to deliver it. I think just to add on to that as well, I think you know, when we talk about the kind of devices and, and things, when it comes to more niche ones, all you have to think about is what kind of inputs do we as human beings have from our eyes, our ears, to our kind of taste. You know, all of those different areas are, can integrate some form of overlaying onto the real world. 
Um, and uh, I think the kind of devices that we will see in the future will you know, make use of all the kind of sensors that we as human beings have as well. The reason I'm putting, bringing this up is because before we had standardization, everybody did their own thing. And that led to different approaches in game design, different approaches in um, control design, and so on and so forth. And from that came the, the standardization when the best designs uh, eventually took over, in a way. But if you're starting from standardization, how do you move on from there? Yeah, just, just yeah, very quickly. We'll just it, wrap it up on this yeah. one, but yeah. Yeah, it, it, AR development at the moment is a bit like the Wild West. I mean, there, everybody can throw something into the market. There is no standardization. There are very few bodies that are actually trying to bring and promote a, 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 a sort of uni path for development. So you always have that with new technology. I remember exactly the same thing with websites where there was various sort of versions floating out there. But eventually, unification will happen in some form. And I think we're not, we're not there yet with AR. It won't happen next year, but we will see a sort of ever-increasing move towards it. Well, I want to thank you very much for your question there. Um, I think we've just, just about run out of time for this panel. Um, I want to thank everyone here for coming along here um, to this AIXR Insights panel here at EGX. Just for context, we're a not-for-profit uh, organization aiming to